So welcome, yes, welcome everyone uh, to our the second event uh, at the Center of Pan African Studies. Uh, my name is uh, Michael, Dr. Mikal Wozdu. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at SOAS, uh, and I will be one of your co-hosts uh, this evening. So welcome. Uh, today we're looking forward to a really rich conversation into a topic that relates to the diaspora in a way that it hasn't been spoken about in this way, uh, or at least it's not part of mainstream kind of conversation around around this. Um, so without further ado, I think I will tell you a little bit more about the Center for African Studies, and then I will pass the mic or the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Casey. So um, as I said, I'm a post one of the postdoctoral research fellow at SOAS, I'm part of the Center for Pan-African Studies. Uh, the Center for Pan-African Studies is a platform for promoting interdisciplinary research, policy dialogue, and public engagement on issues related to the African continent and its diaspora. It is based at the Department of Politics and International Studies, and it facilitates the development of new and ongoing joint research projects, publications, seminars, and collaboration with scholars, civil society actors, and institutions in Africa, the UK, and beyond. So the Center for Pan-African Studies, uh, hosted and supported by the Pan-African Frontiers Project, which is a multi-sided collaborative um, four-year project, research project funded by the UKRI. And, and it brings together contemporary policy discourse around Pan-Africanism with a broad analysis of it as an ideology with a long-standing and multifaceted uh, tradition and history. So before I pass um, the floor to my colleague, Dr. Kiste Kwanteng from Shabaka, just a few um, housekeeping points. So the webinar will be recorded, but don't worry, we'll only record as panelists. So um, there's no, uh, just keep that in mind in relation to your uh, messages in the chat. Um, please use the Q&A box um, to ask your questions. So there will be, towards the end, we'll leave some time for Q&A. Uh, and so you will, should find at the bottom of the, your Zoom page, you'll find a Q&A and then you type your, your, your question. And, and as, as you've already been doing, you can also um, write on the chat. There will be my colleagues, uh, Paul uh, from Shabaka and Aurora, who will keep an eye on the chat. So if there's any issues, um, you can uh, direct a message to them. So thank you and welcome and pass on to Kirsty. Hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Kirsty Quartain, and I am the uh, research manager at Shabaka. And Shabaka is a research and consultancy organization that focuses on migration, diaspora, and humanitarianism. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us this evening. I'm really looking forward to the uh, conversation that we'll be having today. In the discussion today, We'll explore the role of 1.5 and second generation African diaspora in humanitarian action. And we felt that this was a very important uh, topic to discuss because 1.5 and second generation African diasporans serve as essential links, often connecting their countries of settlement or residence to various African countries and identities. They also contribute to the cultural, economic, and political enrichment of communities across borders, and are also vocal advocates for global justice and humanitarian values. However, the role of 1.5 and second generation African diasporans, especially in humanitarian response, is often overlooked in academic discussions, the humanitarian and development sectors, and in media, and in media coverage. So in the conversation that we will be having today, we aim on uh, shedding more light and increasing understanding of the, criti of the critical role played by 1.5 and second generation African diasporas in humanitarian action. So we, after this, we, I will um, introduce our panelists and have them to share um, some information about themselves and their backgrounds. 
We'll have about 30 minutes for the panel discussion, and then we'll have around 15 minutes for, uh, for Q&A. So today, uh, we will be joined by our uh, two panelists, Dr. Bashir Ahmed, who is the CEO of Shabaka, and Sarah Ahmed Koshin, uh, who is the director of the Somali Gender Hub and a PhD candidate at the University of Copenhagen and University of Nairobi. Uh, we were also due to have Sarah Marwan um, join us as well, but unfortunately she uh, has sent her apologies. Uh, she is not feeling very well, so she won't be able to join us and we wish her um, a very speedy recovery. I believe Bashir is also on her way uh, coming as well. So we will begin with uh, Sarah. Uh, so Sarah, thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you could please introduce yourself, your background, share some of the work that you've done with the Somali Gender Hub, as well as some information on your PhD work. Thank you very much, Christy. I hope you can hear me. Um, oh, great. Uh, a very good afternoon or good evening, rather, to you all. I would like to start off by thanking uh, Shabaka and uh, the Center for Pan-African Studies, uh, in particular, uh, Mikhail, for inviting me to this webinar um, on participation in humanitarian action uh, among generation 1.5 and uh, the second generation African diaspora. I'm very, very happy to be here and to participate in this webinar and to share with you um, some of the um, you know, findings of my own research project on Somali uh, diaspora humanitarianism. Um, so my name is, uh, as Christy already said, uh, Sahara Ahmed Koshin. I'm actually right now in Nairobi. I am a, a fourth year, a final year, a PhD student uh, attached to the um, um, a Danida funded uh, project called Somali Diaspora Humanitarianism in Complex Crisis. Uh, Danida is the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Denmark. And so um, uh, the project that I'm a part of is a project that is looking at the important role that Somali diaspora play during disasters in Somalia, you know, how they mobilize themselves, how they um, mobilize for uh, resources, how they channel that resources, uh, and eventually how they disseminate that in, in, uh, in, in various parts in, uh, in the Somali regions. And uh, we're about 10 researchers, we're looking at different, um, you know, sub focus areas. Uh, myself, I'm looking at the role of women and Kirsty, as you already mentioned, uh, gender and generation are you know, topics that are often overlooked in research and academia. And so my research is looking at uh, the role that Somali diaspora business women play um, uh, and, and also female refugees who are based uh, in, in Lusaka, Zambia, um, and how they uh, take part in humanitarianism during disasters. And as a case study, I am looking at a particular uh, flash floods disaster that occurred in, um, in Puntland, state of Somalia. I don't know how many of you are actually uh, uh, informed or knowledgeable about uh, the various states in Somalia. But Puntland is a state, one of the five states in Somalia. And I, uh, there was a flash flood that occurred in Kardo in the year 2020. It was a very disastrous. Uh, very destructive uh, flash floods and the Somali diaspora as well as the Somalis who are living in Somalia uh, took a very important role in mobilizing for support for resources both financial and non-financial and uh, these women in Somalia in, in Zambia uh, they are who are you know small and medium uh, business holders they they uh, played a very significant role in that particular disaster. And so I've been researching the past four or five years. I have been researching almost five years now um, um, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the role that they played, you know, how they organized themselves. And of course, the second generation and generation 1.5 are also some of the people, you know, the responders that I interviewed uh, for my research. That Somali Agenda Hub is a research uh, and training center based in Puntland. And they, among other things, are also exploring, you know, how um, the dynamics of uh, uh, and the African uh, diaspora youth uh, who are on the African continent, because I believe that, you know, in, in my interaction with the existing literature, 
on uh, diaspora humanitarianism. Oftentimes, the African, um, you know, diaspora who are based on the African continent are overlooked. So there's very little known about intra-Africa humanitarianism, and um, how you know support is coming from uh, young people who are already uh, living and working or studying or doing business within the African continent. And I am looking at particularly at the Somali diaspora. I don't know how many of you actually are knowledgeable about the Somali diaspora and the businesses they, they are um, having in Africa, but there's a very strong community in, uh, in Zambia, as well as in Cape Town and in Nairobi. And I look forward to sharing with you some of, you know, uh, some of uh, my work later on. And of course, to answering some of your questions. I, I look very much forward to that. I'm very sorry that Sarah Marwan is not able to join us tonight. Uh, I, we wish her a quick recovery. Thank you so much for now. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I, rem I remember um, attending one of your presentation at ICAS and, you know, not only are you a great speaker, but also, as you said, this um, uh, looking at diaspora engagement through the lens of inter-Africa or even just kind of global south to global south is something that is completely under-researched. And so thank you for joining us today and bring your research and your expertise into the conversation. So it seems like uh, Bashar is still running late. So maybe we can start the conversation with you, Sarah. And um, I can ask you the first question, and then whenever Bashar is able to join us, then we'll um, you know, circle back. Sure. Um, so one of you know we one of the first questions that we had um, was around diaspora, like the broader diaspora engagement, right? So to, today we are focusing on the one point five and second generation, but we want to get a better understanding also of the wider context of uh, diaspora engagement in hum humanitarian responses. So what does that look like uh, across generation? And it seems like this is part of your research, right? You're not focusing only on one generation, you're speaking to different generation and seeing uh, in what ways they engage. So what's your kind of take of the broader uh, issues around diaspora engagement in humanitarian response? Thank you, Mikhail. Um, well, generally speaking, I think um, the African diaspora communities, uh, whether they are on the African continent or elsewhere, uh, have always played a very important role in humanitarian action, in development work in their home countries. We know from the vast existing, for example, research studies and assessment reports by different uh, humanitarian organizations, as well as from our own research, uh, that African diaspora have, for example, been sending remittances to their families and communities for uh, for a very long time, and uh, these remittances are, uh, for, you know, very life saving. Um, uh, initiatives for education, for healthcare. Uh, they send in, uh, they send uh, financial contributions during disasters as well. And um, some of the some of the characteristics of the African diaspora in relation to humanitarianism that I have read about and that I have discovered as well in my own observations in my study is that you know oftentimes they are the the the, the African diaspora they act faster. So when a calamity occurs. The African diaspora, because of their own existing social ties and networks, they can act faster than NGOs, and they sometimes also are able to access, you know, uh, communities and places that uh, um, that organizations that have been working in the area for over twenty or thirty years cannot access. Uh, they contribute also by, um, you know, through their existing organizations. For example, um, they uh, I know from uh, from the from from my engagement with different diaspora networks that there are existing civil society organizations in various communities, both in the African continent and outside, that are already having some kind of a structure that makes it easier for them to mobilize resources to respond to uh, disasters. Um, and what we also uh, have read is that, um, you know, the, 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 the African diaspora uh, actually utilize less resources in doing all of this important work in comparison to organizations uh, such as the international NGOs who often rely on security mechanisms to, to be able to deliver or, or, or even need translation, for example, because they lack, you know, the, the cultural and religious 
and um, 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 you know, access to the communities. So the African diaspora play very important roles. And in the country that I am from myself in Somalia during the war from a, in the 1990s, um, you know, it was the diaspora that was actually providing important uh, life-saving uh, support to communities and they are still doing so. Um, and this phenomena is a phenomena that, you know, re scholars have tried to understand as to what connects Somalis who have lived elsewhere, uh, sometimes even born uh, outside of the country, and, and they are still so much, you know, involved, so much uh, connected, so much uh, giving. Uh, the concept of giving is very, very important to understand why um, Somalis and, and, and the rest of the African diaspora give uh, to people they don't even know sometimes. Uh, you know, sometimes people they don't even um, have have not met uh, simply because there's that you know patriotic or, or solidarity feeling with the communities that they are from. They are transnational networks, you know, that they are part of. So this is something that we are uh, as a as a project we have been trying to look at from various angles. Some of us are looking at it from a technology perspective. You know, what role does the technology play in facilitating all of this? Uh, what role do the young people play indeed? And what role do uh, women play in my case? Uh, we are also looking at things like, you know, um, the role of the religious leaders and traditional elders, uh, or rather the politicization of aid. Um, and so the, some, the, 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 the African diaspora, I think, uh, Mikhail, uh, they, 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 they play important roles. The only, the only thing that I have, that I think is a weak point is that um, the African diaspora play, um, they, they are delivering all of this important and very good work, uh, you know, in parallel to existing humanitarian organizations that oftentimes don't tap into the, the, the African diaspora already existing networks and social ties and connections and, um, um, you know, they, what, what we have also seen is that the African diaspora, once they are on board, they, they, they are able to stay even longer, even after the disaster has happened, you know, they, they will stay on being connected to the people because it's not something that is time bound. Uh, the, the, the concept of giving, uh, you know, there is reciprocity. You are giving, but you're also getting. And um, if you look at the motivations, I think this is a topic that we will discuss later on as to why, uh, you know, um, African diaspora communities uh, who are outside of the African continent and outside of their nation states are so involved and interacted with, you know, interacting with, uh, with the communities. Um, you know, motivation plays an important role as to why, uh, um, you know, uh, African diaspora are, are so connected. What is the what is the motivation? And this is something that I think of my uh, co-panelists will also uh, discuss later on. And I, I look forward to contributing to that specific component of motivation as well later on. Thank you. This is like the, the perfect timing. <laughs> Let's uh, welcome uh, Bashar Ahmed. Welcome, welcome. Glad you could make it. <laughs> no, thank you. I sincerest apologies. I think um, I can have another day about talking about uh, roads and transports and all of this. Uh, <laughs> Sahara is like different countries. Everyone has something called traffic. <laughs> That's but, totally fine. We are happy that you could make it. And um, I guess we will just ask you to share a few lines uh, and introduce yourself. Um, yes, and then we'll follow up with some other questions. Thank you. No, thank you. And thank you all for, for being here. And thank you, Mikhail and Kirsty and other colleagues and um, uh, for organizing this event. I think we don't talk enough about that generational engagement on diaspora. So uh, my name is Bashar Ahmed. Uh, I work at Shabaka, uh, a diaspora organization focused on diaspora migration and humanitarianism. So we do ma mainly research and we work across different countries and regions. Most recently, we've been doing a lot of work on Sudan and, and, and such. The other hat, which is it's a close, uh, you know, a topic close to my heart as well. This is this is also academic topic of interest, is one point five second generation diaspora. So that comes from my academic background, where I've done research on um, uh, engagement of that particular group from the Horn of Africa in uh, uh, um, in the countries of or regions of origins. So I looked at um, 
uh, diaspora from you know some uh, 1.5 second generation diaspora from Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, South Sudan. Um, and Djibouti was a bit harder to kind of find individuals because it, you know with French and all of this, and um, it was quite for me fascinating. So I looked at those in London and Washington DC, and and I. I really, I think we're missing something because when we talk about diaspora, most people just think first generation, but we don't think about what happens to that mixture of different identities. Um, what happens to those in, um, uh, individuals? So we can, sometimes we kind of, you know, lump youth. I'm not youth, <laughs> for example, I'm like part of second generation. So I think some we should kind of also be conscious that youth or young people um, is it almost a different category and different needs whilst when you're talking about 1.5 and second gen um, these are different things but I hope that kind of uh, answers but uh, please uh, task away <laughs> thank you thank you and actually I uh, was thinking maybe it'll be good to also define what we mean by 1.5 and second generation because I feel like sometimes because obviously you're speaking about you know, how often people, when they say talk about 1.5 or second generation, they think about youth, but no, with the different cohorts across different generations. So what do we mean when we say 1.5 and what do we mean when we say second generation? Oh, I had so many questions like, why do you have the numbers? What, what's with the digits? And different people have different understanding of it. So, um, so 1.5 was just to kind of say you're not quite first generation or second generation is for those who might have born in um, a particular kind of um, of their you know uh, parents or one of their parents heritage countries um, uh, for example somebody um, who was born maybe in Nigeria and uh, uh, came as a child as a three-year-old or even as an eight-year-old or something like that so most of the experience is probably belonging uh, that but based on census data your first generation so you really don't fit either boxes so that's the whole idea. While second generation is more kind of straightforward, you were born outside and, you know, grew up outside. You do have facets of this because you have people who don't fit neatly into this and we have to recognize uh, these nuances. These are just, again, generic categories because the experiences of migration of movement is so diverse. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, and then there are, you know, the academic definitions and then what's the, you know, how people identify and, you know, what are the shaping experiences uh, in the way they construct the sense of identity and belonging. And as you said, that can, I mean, it's on a, on a continuum, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. And um, and I think one thing is, um, it should, should be self-identifying. You should not be saying to someone, you are definitely 1.5 or so you can just kind of put like the loose definitions, but it's for individuals to also recognize whether this is something they, that they feel reflects their experiences. I don't think you can, you could ever, ever have someone neatly in one box. Um, however, it's just to kind of be able to start articulating your particular experiences, your feelings. Um, maybe I'll, you know, my own experience, I was born in Qatar, um, went a bit, uh, you know, studied uh, only a bit, uh, you know, primary school in Sudan, but otherwise have been in the UK. So I have this kind of weird linkages with different parts of the, the world. So it's, um, yeah, so I don't think I fit into the one, uh, you know, the first generation or second generation or the 1.5 or it's just because of this transnational identities that comes into play. So, um, and I think this is where we need to keep researching because also technology and globalization and all of these factors are adjusting our identities. Just look at the, the misery that is the news nowadays. It really kind of put into perspective, like how do I feel about this or where do I stand? It really is kind of um, setting a tone and it just kind of shows identities are fluid are not they're not set on stone. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So we we had a chance to already ask uh, Sarah a little bit uh, from her research and the personal experience. And I think something that also we it, it's important to acknowledge and is quite unique about this panel, but also as a host, we all are not only in our, here in our capacity of researchers, but also have a personal 
experience, right? As a second generation for 1.5, well, however we want to, you know, identify ourselves. So it's almost as the like we are insider outsider into the research and the work that we do. And I feel like this is something that needs to be celebrated. As we know, academia doesn't really reflect, you know, the diversity um, of this panel. But going going back to our theme today, um, so Sarah, we spoke a little bit about the role of diaspora. You know what are you what are kind of um her experience in terms of uh response humanitarian responses and the engagement that there is, and maybe with you I want to go to our not to the second question around uh what are kind of the misconceptions that not only academically uh, we have but also on the, uh, you know uh, anecdotally around the engagement of uh, second generation specifically in the humanitarian response. Because we also often sometimes actually hear about, you know, migrant communities supporting through remittances and, you know, in many ways. Uh, but what are the role of the second generation um, in the response? If you can tell me, based on your research and personal experience. Um, who's this question for? You muted me, for Bishak. Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Anecdotally, it's um, it's one of those things which is, and this is when you can tell my age. It's um, I think I wrote a paper back in two thousand five about second generation diaspora, and um, uh, I was at with Amnesty International at the time, and I think I was just <laughs> really frustrated. Because in every room I kind of went to, it's kind of people's like, you know, you know nothing about Sudan, or even though I was working professionally on Sudan at the time, uh, the second point was people would be laughing at my accents or something like that, so kind of dismissed. Or if I went to certain events, it was, it was a clique of like people who knew each other. So you are always, I'm like, I'm an outsider in this country. <laughs> I'm an outsider here as well. Um, and they're quite dismissive. Oh, you're lazy. You don't appreciate what we've gone through and all of this. So there is a cultural and uh, not gener generation, but also cultural disconnect. Um, and a lot of people are doing that. So, and when we talk about second generation diaspora engagement and humanitarian responses and all of that, there's several layers to it that might not be, because they don't have the same networks as the first generation. Their responses are not for specific communities of origin. Like they're not gonna be going straight to the, you know, the village that might be interested in, um, if you are in, uh, uh, you know, Philippines, it might, you know, it might not be the specific locality that was affected by um, a particular crisis, but it might be just generally for kind of Philippines, other areas. So that kind of focus doesn't happen. The second layer to it is identities are much more broader. And what we've seen actually in terms of our research and all of this is um, what we've seen kind of generation is people who are not responding necessarily to origin countries or even regions of origin. But something broader identities like uh, Islamic identity. I still remember uh, during it was actually more the European migration crisis rather than anyone else's. Um, um, and uh, what you had, sorry, let me just sign in this. What you had was um, people kind of responding, uh, you know, from Pakistan, from you know the heritage is from Pakistan, third generation from Pakistan or from other countries who responding to supporting those who are in Calais or other places. So this is when you realize actually there's a driver. So the motivation might have been specifically countries of origin, but where it's applied is not necessarily countries of origin or even regions of origin. It's much more broader. It's just um, evokes that empathy. Um, but I can bring in a lot more examples, but I don't want to hog the floor as well. I would love to hear from everyone else on that. Thank you, Vashai. Sarah, what are your thoughts on uh, misconception of second generation? Thank you, uh, Mikhail. Thank you also uh, to Bashai. I, I would like to actually start off by uh, sort of briefly commenting on what you, both of you have just said, you know, in relation to being the, the insider, but also at the same time, the, the outsider, and you're participating, but sometimes you're also you know, observing and how you're impacted as a researcher, 
in, 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 in a research topic that very much concerns you, that you can identify with, that you are related in so many different ways to whether uh, through your identities or uh, through your own experiences or connections. Um, you know, I myself, I, um, I was born in Somalia. I, I, oh, I like mentioning examples and case studies to, to highlight a point. So let me just briefly mention uh, a little bit uh, about my background uh, and how that has benefited me in understanding this, this topic of, uh, you know, the African diaspora and humanitarianism. Uh, so I was born in Somalia, but I grew up in Zambia. Uh, like many Somalis, um, you know, they, I, I, I didn't grow up in Somalia, I grew up in Zambia, and later on I went to the Netherlands, where I did uh, my uh, uh, education, I managed to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get a, a master's degree in anthropology, and then in 2008, I was one of the very first um, Somalis who, within the framework of an EU-funded uh, project called uh, Diaspora Partnership Program, uh, whereby the EU uh, partnered with Care Somalia and an existing Somalia NGO, uh, where they were looking for you know Somalis who were highly educated in, in uh, you know outside of the country to go back and contribute to the development uh, and, and and peace building efforts in in the country. And so I was one of uh, a large team, and I was the only young person in way back in 2008, and and I was the only female as well, and so. I was, of course, much younger, and I, I, I wasn't, um, you know, I, I, I'm married now. I'm a mother. I wasn't then, and I, I came with a, a big bag of dreams, you know. I, I came with a, a very high expectation, you know. I was so motivated to go back to my after having lived in Zambia and uh, and in Holland for so long. I, I, I really looked forward to contributing to understanding, and. Um, and I have been there ever since. I'm actually based in Garaway, Puntland, even though right now I'm in Nairobi for, for my education and uh, uh, you know for my PhD. But it's very important to mention all of this in relation to the topic we're discussing today because we are researchers. We're talking about you know, a topic that uh, I'm very much a part and parcel of. And, uh, it, and I think it, it brings so much you know, benefit uh, that someone else would otherwise not have. And that's why it's very important to sit down and, and, and understand the context and live the realities of young people in order to understand how their humanitarianism differs from the old generations. And um, like I said, I, I'm very fond of examples and case studies. And so my own research project, um, you know, I, I tried very much to, for example, one of the tools that I used to collect data was focus group discussions. And so when we had one of these, um, you know, focus group discussions with Somali women, I noticed that the Somali young people who, who were born in Zambia or grew up in Zambia, the so-called 1.5 uh, generation, didn't really say a whole lot in these groups. You know, they listened, they had a pen and paper, they were very fond of taking notes, but they didn't really contribute, you know, verbally. And I sat down with them and I tried to understand why this was so outside of the group discussion. And I discovered that, you know, um, they have a whole lot to say. And sometimes there are language barriers that they, that sort of excludes them from this you know, public discussions. And so that's a very important point to understand before I mention, uh, before I respond to your question, Mikhail, on the misconceptions. Just let me briefly say some of the trends that I have seen with young people, uh, you know, your second generation or 1.5 generation uh, who grew up in my, in my case study, for example, in Zambia. So why is it important to examine like, these experiences? Because by doing so, we gain you know, insight into the complexities that these young people are living, and I, I living in. And I think Bashair very vividly highlighted you know, the, the fact that you know, um, um, you, know, you are de dealing with you know, sometimes dual or triple or multiple identities, whether religious, whether cultural, um, and so on. And so it's very, very, uh, you know, um, problematic, or rather, it's not easy to manage these identities because, on the one hand, you are a Somali, you are living with, with the Somali, you know, you're living in a Somali household, you're expected to speak the language and adhere to Somali, you know, uh, cultural norms and, 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 and play your social role. But on the other hand, you are also uh, having this, 
you know, uh, roots or rather, or rather this, uh, the, uh, connections to the country of, so, uh, uh, and the culture of, uh, you know, in Zambia, in my case, in my case, but also I have seen with, with many young people, for example, in the UK or in Canada, for example, where, you know, I was part of a project that explored their lived realities and their experiences. And so this delicate balance actually shapes their experiences and influences their contributions, um, you know, into the social fabric of humanitarianism. You know, how do you take part? Uh, when do you take part, you know, and the role of the family. And so what I have observed in the 14 years that I have lived and worked in Somalia, as well as in East Africa, is that these young people often have great ideas. They are technologically, you know, um, very much involved in humanitarianism. And that's how they differ from the old generation. You know, they're very tech savvy. Uh, their technological contributions and inventions can actually be made available to enhance and facilitate um, you know, uh, humanitarianism. Um, whereas on the on the one hand, you have the older generation that are very much, you know, tied to the country who migrated uh, to foreign countries decades ago. They have a deeper understanding of the cultural, social, and political dynamics. Um, in my case, Somalia, and whereas these young people may not necessarily have that, you know, uh, that frame of reference. And, um, and so second generation uh, uh, young people, um, what I have observed is that they, they, they use the language, for example, they speak multiple languages and sometimes this can be to the benefit uh, of um, you know, whether it is uh, community development, whether it is um, and, and humanitarian engagement, but what are, what are some of the ways that uh, or unique mechanisms that young, these young people are in, in engaged in humanitarianism? And I have noted the following. For example, first of all, the ways that young people are informed about what's, whatever is happening in their home countries, in the countries that their parents are from, it, they, they are informed in different ways. One of the important ways is through social media, for example. Um, I, I, I have interviewed uh, an, a group of elderly men and women in Zambia who were still listening to the radio, uh, BBC London, uh, BBC Somalia London. And, and, and at five o'clock every day, the Somalis would get their, the radio and listen to it. And that, that, that's how they're connected to what's happening in Somalia because it's been said in, so in, in the Somali language, even though now it's available on social media and it's live streamed uh, through, through, for example, YouTube, they're still using the radio and young people are not. Um, the other ways that young people are involved is um, they, for example, in the, in, the, in, the, in the flashcards that I am documenting, they were able to create GoFundMe's. These are, these are ways of humanitarian engagement that we have not seen previously um, in flash floods. So they were able, they were able to speedily you know, um, create websites, uh, uh, GoFundMe's and, and fundraise from a distance. And so these are, these are some of the ways that they are actually, uh, they, are, they, they differ. But I think at the heart of the matter is, are young people as equally connected to their home countries as their parents? They are not equally connected. They are connected in different ways. And I think um, if you look at the Somalia Mogadishu uh, uh, example, for example, in 2017, we had a crisis, uh, a drought in Somalia. And these young people, uh, a, a group of young people from Sweden and um, elsewhere in, 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 in the West, you know, so they, they came together online and they were able to create um, um, the first ever um, you know, crisis mapping initiative, whereby they were able to um, uh, take the country of Somalia geographically and locate where each partner was delivering what um, resource. Uh, and this, you know, this made it easier also not only for the diaspora, but also for the government of Somalia, as well as for international NGOs to use this application that young people, um, young people uh, developed to understand the ongoing drought of 2017 and how, uh, um, it, uh, how uh, you know, organizations could deliver life-saving medicine or water or, or food. And, and I think these are some of the ways that young people are taking part in, in humanitarianism that's often not documented. Where do they discuss these things? I have seen lately that they are on Twitter spaces or rather X it's called nowadays. Huh? They are on, on and, and they're very critical 
They are very critical. They are uh, talking about anti-tribalism movements. They are against tribalism. They are against corruption. Um, look at Somali Sideways, for example, one of the initiatives that these young people have come up with. In Mogadishu, if you go to Mogadishu or, or Garawe or some of the major cities in Somalia, you will come across hubs, uh, technological hubs, innovation hubs, that, are being, that have been invented by young Somali diaspora who from a distance came up with the idea and looked for funding sometimes. They even funded it themselves initially and later on, um, later on were, you know, were able to access, access um, funding. Finally, the Somali um, second generation and 1.5 generation are also taking uh, part or leading the colonization agenda in Somalia and the localization uh, of aid in Somalia. And um, as you know, a few years ago, the government of the federal government of Somalia, you know, came up with the localization agenda, whereby organizations that initially were established in Nairobi and were running the uh, development and humanitarian aid from Nairobi, but being implemented in Somalia now. That's not the case anymore. Organizations have, they, they, they now have a presence in Somalia and young people were in the forefront of, of all of this. And, um, and, and they are fond of using hashtags. These are things that, you know, the old generation are not, you know, necessarily involved in. And so it really requires time and patience to sit down with how young people are taking part in, you know, being connected to the motherland, playing a big role, but also importantly, as we're discussing today, humanitarianism. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for that very, I think even saying comprehensive might be, just might be an understatement, but thank you so much for that very comprehensive overview of uh, the motivations and misconceptions of around um, the young 1.5 and second generation um, Somali, their um, engagement in humanitarian action. I was very interested and kind of, I don't know, surprised is the right word, but I was very interested to see that there are some similarities um, between what you found with uh, 1.5 and second generation uh, diasporans on the continent and what I found in my own research with um, second generation Ghanaians, um, mainly in outside of the continent, mainly in uh, London and in New York City. So I, I think generally there there isn't a, still isn't enough information on the experiences of 1.5 and second generation individuals. So uh, these conversations that we can have as researchers, as people with uh, lived experience, I think bring brings out the sim you know the similarities and differences that exist in our experiences. So thank you so much uh, for for that wonderful uh, information. Um, Bashir, I have a question for you. Um, being that you have a lot of, I believe, I believe, 20 years of professional experience in this space, as well as you know, PhD academic experience uh, in this space. So, based on your expertise in both the academic and professional space in humanitarianism, what would you say uh, the gaps are in our understanding of the contributions of 1.5 and second generation Africans in, in humanitarian action? No, thank you so much for that, Kirsty. And uh, uh, Zahra, you know, you've raised um, Sahara. Is it Sahara? So, Zahra. Yeah, um, I think you've raised, uh, you know, quite a lot of important and pertinent points. And I think what's um, it's important to kind of realize there's different facets to this. Migration will continue. You'll have continue to have different generations. Set. So, the second point is humanitarian crises don't last weeks or months, the last years, decades, generationally. So if you want to engage diaspora, you have to realize this needs building relationships and doing that. And uh, what's happening is, um, and um, research cannot be static. And I think all of us know this in the, in, you know, in this space, uh, it needs to be a continual process of learning, and understanding context, the evolution of it, how things change, how it evolves. So policy responses are based on these evidence. And at the moment, how can policymakers, whether in origin countries or settlement countries, be able to respond to that? It's tricky to deal with kind of generational diaspora engagement because there's no sources of information because they're not captured in any census data. They are, because census data is based on where you're born or, um, you know, ethnicity, but that, you know, you don't have a tick box necessarily for everyone available. Um, 
they have different access to sources of information. So, and I think a lot of a lot of the focus has been on policies to engage diaspora in development in origin countries, but we have not looked at policy engagement at uh, you know humanitarian diaspora engagement. That's a missing because at the moment, like if you look at any of the crises globally, Ukraine and all of this, and you know we've been documenting this at Shabaka, you know, um, the diaspora have been at the forefront of providing that support. They are the lifeline. They are the supporters of those frontline responders. Um, they are at key capitals uh, if you're based in the global north or um, and such. So they have a potential of, uh, you know, a lot more influence. And, um, and, the, and I think there has to be a bit of more concerted effort at uh, settlement countries. How do you engage with that? Because at the moment, we there's not enough data. There's not, not enough research in that particular area. Um, and I think, uh, Sahir, I think you've raised quite a lot of things. What we also need when we, we talk about research is let's not do, I think the coloniality is so, such an important element of it. Do not research 1.5 second generation diaspora. They should be a part and parcel of this, you know, be inside a researcher. There's a lot more added value because it's about building trust relationships and all of this. Um, so even if you want to research about a particular community that is not yours, which is fine, but do it collaboratively, you know, co-production, all of these kind of emphasis um, and not as a subject. I think this is one of the risks a lot of people tend to fall into. Um, and finally, the last point is, um, what I kind of seen is increasingly people's like um, in the humanitarian sector, there's a lot of funding costs, there's more crises and a lot of funding costs. So everyone is looking at where funding pots are. And unfortunately for some, they see diaspora as the potential cash machine or ATM uh, to fund their initiatives. So um, I cannot even recall how many times I've had calls where people kind of approach us like, we want to fundraise from the diaspora, uh, you know, ex you know, specific diaspora for these projects, fabulous project we have in country X. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. You have to build relationships. You have to build trust. It has to be in partnerships. So I think one of the things that's missing in the conversation is how some kind of, uh, you know, the humanitarian system sees diaspora. So some of them see diaspora as a risk. And yes, not all diaspora is, it's not always conducive relationships. Um, the second point is not all diaspora have conducive relationship with the origin countries. This is something to also realize. Um, and thirdly, it's increasingly we're seeing diaspora treated as either beneficial, you know, targets for fundraising or as beneficiaries, so not as equal partners. So this is at the organizational levels. And what you have is a, a more professional or kind of more organized 1.5 second generation. So first generation might have been a more community, but I think the pattern that's kind of starting to emerge is you have more structures, more groups, more professional groups um kind of forming so that needs to be recognized so don't take the space of the diaspora work with them collaborate with them but increasingly what we're seeing is not necessarily going in a positive direction i think what you touched on essentially about um creating space for the diaspora that's something that quite hasn't it hasn't quite been done in the humanitarian sector and i think in relation to that, I think it would be great if you could kind of um, share with the attendees why you started Shabaka. You explained, you know, when you came, you know, what you know, Shabaka does as a you know, research organization, diaspora led, which is very important. But I think if you could just share a bit more explicitly, like kind of the, the rationale uh, be behind um, uh, starting Shabaka. Yes. Um, so I kind of, my background, I kind of worked in the international humanitarian system. So I've worked with the UN, with the international organizations, worked in different contexts and different countries. What I was increasingly seeing is um, this dichotomy of, you know, local and international staff. Um, so this unequal power dynamics. Um, in a lot of international organizations who work in the um, global majority countries, uh, what you see is you could be sitting at the same room as someone, your colleague doing the same job, but because you are local, 
you get probably a tenth of the salary of the international. And that inequality was so pervasive. Um, the second part was the humanitarian system was, you know, taking all the accolades, like we've done this and that, but the diaspora were doing so much with local groups and organizations. So the concept of mutual aid, we're seeing it in Sudan, we're seeing it in other places. They're the ones who are kind of stepping up. They're the ones sustaining communities. They are the social protection mechanisms in a lot of these contexts. And that was not recognized in terms of the institutional humanitarian um, structure. So we need to start talking about ecosystem because you have so many other players who are stepping up. You could have seen, um, just an example, not even talking about, you know, the sort of African context, just look at the context, even in the UK during COVID, look at the concept of mutual aid, like um, when people couldn't leave their homes or were ill, they needed someone to help them to get food shopping. You know, your neighbors came in and all of this. So this kind of sense of community, mutual trust and all of this, yes, it might take place online um, or um, in other ways, so I think seeing all these gaps, I think it was kind of necessary to kind of look into this, what's happening with diaspora, but also a humanitarian context, because everyone was talking about remittances. I love the figures about, it's about $800 billion a year that diaspora through official channels are sending to origin countries. So that's, I think, what engaged a lot of people and gained a lot of interest. However, it's the that the, the advocacy it's um you know the second shift work <laughs> that's being done that is not recognized um uh you know the advocacy the support the it it comes in so many different forms and i think we need to stop talking about money talk about what does humanitarian engagement is because people assume it's about sending money or clothes or something like that no it's much more than that um and i think this is where we need to bring all these nuances and just articulate it a bit more clearly and all of this. So um, to everyone, and some, a lot, oh yeah. And another thing is diaspora don't recognize they're doing humanitarian work. The number of times we've been in research stuff, like, we don't do humanitarian. They think it's, you have to be, have something like that International Federation for the Red Cross, you know, the big signage with the cars. No, they're like, yeah, the, you know, there was floods. We sent, you know, a couple of hundreds. Like, yeah, this is, <laughs> that's the humanitarian work. It's recognizing also, it comes in so many different shapes and form. And I'm happy to kind of discuss further, but um, yeah, let me leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sarah, can you, what are your thoughts based on the um, brush I have shared? Because uh, you, you were touching on this, uh, in your introduction, right, the importance of networks, the importance of, you know, diaspora communities and how they're often the first responses. So it's almost like you are you have seen and experienced the same things, whether be it like from personal experience, career, academically. So clearly there's something that is not being picked up, right? Yes, Mikhail. Um, I think... Um... I think you know there there is a, you know I agree with Bashir. There is a, 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 a we we need to understand more how humanitarianism is being driven by the the African diaspora, um, and indeed the humanitarianism is not all about money, um, and and so we need to begin with more research on this, and um, you know uh, projects like the one that I'm involved in is trying to understand uh, this from different angles. And um, my own case study, looking at the role of women and young women in humanitarianism, um, you know, what I would say is that we, we need to acknowledge this group uh, as important contributors uh, to both humanitarianism uh, and sustainable development. Um, uh, from the very short time that I have engaged with um, the Somali women, uh, you know, on the African continent, um, in particular in Zambia, but also here in Kenya, is that, you know, at the end of the day, even though these young people were born elsewhere, uh, they very much identify with and 
are connected emotionally. They're connected um, to to their home home homeland, but there are some challenges that they are facing, and some of them uh, have to do with, the, for example, the the language barrier. Um, and so I would highly recommend that there be, you know, uh, for example, information sessions, um, you know, for young people to to know more about, uh, you know, at a very young age, um, to know more about their country, um, um, you know. To, be, to participate in these information sessions, I think that uh, if the young people are exposed at a very young age to uh, ways that they can engage with, you know, the dynamics of uh, the context of their own home countries, that there will there will be it will be easier for them to later on, you know, tap into these opportunities. Um, the second thing I would like to say is that um, there are a number of um, programs currently that enable or make it possible for you know, highly trained, highly skilled African diaspora to go back home um, from the West. And uh, there are very few opportunities for African diaspora on the African continent. Uh, you know, my research is looking at intra-Africa humanitarianism, you know, and uh, from, from what I have seen and my engagement with young people on the African continent in different countries, um, Somali and non-Somali, is that there is a desire to be involved, to go back, uh, and, you know, albeit even, you know, just briefly to go back home and and see. And um, uh, there's fear among young people because um, sometimes, um, especially in post-conflict or conflict countries, uh, you know, there are some stereotypes that exist, and so um, young people really desire to go to go back home and 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 have some kind of a support mechanism already that they can tap into or be a part of. Uh, once, once, uh, once there, and um, and and you know the African Union, for example, doesn't even uh, you know their policy doesn't include the African diaspora in any of their programs. And I think that is a pity. Um, if you look at the literature on diaspora, uh, the definition of diaspora, sometimes you know you you, you ask yourselves, what do we know about African diaspora? Is you know why why is there very little known about the African diaspora, and um, the, the the you know the, those studies that are already existing about the African diaspora on the African continent is that they they are studied as refugees or asylum seekers, but not as the vibrant communities that they are. Uh, they are very strong business communities on the African continent. And if you compare that with, uh, you know, Africans who went to the West to seek asylum and uh, I, I, and have maybe social access to social welfare, uh, you know, on the African continent, people are doing business more more into business, you know, and um, uh, and and are very much giving, very much giving, and we need to understand how that happens, how that takes shape and form. Uh, when it comes to young people, uh, young women in particular. Um, you know, the, 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 for, for example, they, they really desire um, to, to go home and stay for a short time, but then they, before they go home, they want to be fully informed. And these information sessions do not exist, unfortunately, because uh, programs like the, the one by UN Media and IOM that um, that are always looking for highly skilled Af Somali diaspora, for example, from the West, from Canada, from Australia, uh, to go back as doctors, as teachers, as 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 you know, uh, lawyers and uh, program managers, the different program uh, programs. They don't really, um, you know, tap into these African diaspora who are educated and have you know degrees from the African African universities. And I think this. Um, you know, it falls under the decolonizing uh, humanitarianism and the ways and approach to it. Uh, it's a pity, really, because these young people, as my case study highlights, you know, play very important roles. And these are some of the, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, specific details that I really want to highlight in my own project. That even though I'm looking at business women, I'm also now very much interested in the 1.5 and second generation by young um, you know, Somali women in Zambia and, and, and what they can do from a distance. And, and many, many other, by the way, not only in Zambia, but in, on the African continent and how that you know, differs from the African diaspora on, in the West and you know, how there are similarities or differences and how there can be complementarity uh, to fill in each other's gaps. 
Thank you so much, Sarah. And um, we we have a number of questions coming through from uh, our attendees. Yeah. Sorry, but I wait. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to kind of add one point, and because I just kind of like triggered it because um, this concept of because diaspora only get if you're kind of one point four, like you tend to when if you get the approach to go to your origin country, it's only within the context of family, so you never get to discover the country beyond that. So it tends to really skew your knowledge. So you really have to go outside from that. There's actually a really interesting initiative. I'm just going to put it in the chat for everyone, which is um, called um, uh, Birthright Africa, which is to, gets a program to get young people to go to Ghana and I think other countries, but um, just to kind of connect and to build these relationships. And this is an example of, you know, some countries where this has happened. So young people get the opportunity to do that. Because this is, because I understand this is going to be your future allies, your advocate. And because we have to, you know, if you're policy making, you really need to think in decades, not in one or two years just to get elected. So, <laughs> but I'll just, uh, yeah, look forward to the questions. I mean, and, and the questions really speak to what uh, both of you have really explained and highlighted in a very nuanced ways, right? So some of the issues around decolonizing, how we understand human the humanitarian action and responses, understanding how diverse it can be, uh, but also how to almost uh, al like allow, like make it more available and accessible for uh, you know potential allies both in the continent, so both in those in those country and in the diaspora, right? So seeing this as a level, equal level uh, partnership and not something that's just extractive, whether it's the diaspora that's just, you know, the ATM or the local actors who are just there to connect you to the, you know, to the right people, to the right organization. So finding a way to really um, engage in this work uh, in a more ethical way, right? And actually the questions that are being raised speak to this tension, right? Between how do we facilitate uh, the engagement of the diaspora, whether they're second generation, 1.5, particularly when the access for training or to information is not readily accessible. Uh, so both of you mentioned language as a barrier. So for example, one of the questions that we had is also uh, you know, how can second generation diasporic individuals find opportunities or get involved within this space? As a student, I've learned a lot about the Western structure of power and how it's built to disadvantage Africa in particular, but it's hard to find humanitarian organizations who are willing to mentor, intern, employ recent graduates. So if you have, do you have any practical advice uh, on how, you know, one can enter into this space? Um, that would be one question. And maybe I'll ask another one so you can both uh, kind of think about it as well. And the other question was, um, another question that came up was around actually diaspora groups and having a connection with donors. I think Bashar, you mentioned this, you know, um, people trying to approach the diasporic organization and say, okay, we want to raise funds. Do you have the connection? So how do we go about leveling that kind of power dynamic and uh you know you mentioned an eco creating an ecosystem and it feels like this is one of the shabaka missions right to create an ecosystem uh what else can we do um what is missing and i'll leave it to that and see where we get where we go with time ah oh, it's a lot of um it's a lot to kind of respond to but there's no um, clear answer and I think it's a work in progress in many ways I think there are some tools that are available um, so just in the first question about how to enter the sector it's hard and it's getting harder um, there's a lot of cuts um, it's, it's quite challenging but there are smaller initiatives here and there like uh, for example with the you know the British Red Cross We've been uh, doing a, they have a diaspora program where they've been looking at um, engaging um, with uh, getting um, diaspora interns. So unfortunately, the opportunities are far in, uh, in between. But I think 
I think just you have to keep trying and um, just build your experience and also share your knowledge, capture it. I think one thing we don't do is we don't document enough about our knowledge and own it. Um, write blogs, post about it and uh, and such. And I think building that, um, that would, uh, would help quite a lot uh, on that. But happy to, if you drop us an email uh, to kind of like explore um, and send you kind of more details on that. In terms of... Um, what else is happening is the localization agenda. So localization is a reference to a commitment made back in 2016 at the World Humanitarian Summit that most of the humanitarian aid goes directly to local organization. Uh, that 25% uh, of all the global uh, aid goes there to international organization. At the time, it was only 2% going directly to local organizations. Since then it's dropped to 1%. So it's quite shameful um, and people need to be called out on it. So, and I think um, as yeah, the thing is a lot of diaspora organizations are, you know, focus is in a small organization where might not have the, you know, the ability to kind of highlight some of these opportunities. So I think working in coalition, I think something we tend to do is we go into our own countries of origin, but we don't work across um so you'll have the you know the syrians might just work with syrians and all of this but we've had the experience where the cross learning um we had a project uh, with the usid where we worked with haitian syrian and sudanese diaspora and one uh when you had the earthquake in turkey and uh northern syria um early in the year um we had the Haitian, because of their experience with the, the earthquake, they were able to kind of support, to, uh, you know, share that knowledge with the Syrian groups. So that cross learning is so important um, on that. I think we, we should demand more, um, not from necessarily just from governments, but also regional bodies. The African Union have a diaspora uh, 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 entity unit and so you actually have all of this at work. So you have all of these policies and, and, and such as just about actioning it and just kind of be focused in terms of the messages, your asks and um, and such. But uh, Sahar, maybe you want to ask some questions and then I can jump in. I'm trying to also look through. So remind me if I missed anything. So apologies. I think, uh, Mikhail, you would like me to respond as well, right? <laughs> um, first of all, I look forward to answering the questions. There are so many questions for you, for Shair, and for me as well. So I look forward to engaging with the audience. Thank you for being patient, audience. <laughs> um, but just briefly, um, yeah, some of my thoughts on how to enhance that partnership with organizations, you know. I think, first of all, what, um, uh, you know, the international organizations and development uh, organizations should do is to first of all understand try to understand uh, so you know the african diaspora you know their their differences their dynamics the context uh, background connection to the countries that they represent you know, try to understand um, and then secondly acknowledge their contributions um, you know the african diaspora has been there long before sometimes even these organizations went to these specific, you know, locations. Um, they have been contributing, and they um, respond faster. They stay longer. They contribute significantly, uh, you know. And I, and I, like I said, I'm fond of I'm fond of uh, examples. Um, in in 2017 in Somalia, the international community donated uh, to the drought to 517 million US dollars, whereas the Somalis. Uh, diaspora and the Somalis at home, by the way, that's a very important technology as well. Uh, they contributed over 2.2, uh, you know, a billion US, United States dollars. And so obviously they are doing much more, <laughs> contributing much more. So it's very important to understand. Um, but we can't generalize and say there is an African diaspora or a Somali diaspora or Sudanese diaspora. We need to understand uh, the different actors within this the, the group, you know, acknowledgement for young people, for example, acknowledgement for young women uh, or women in general and, and the contributions they make. 
And, and, and I think uh, development organizations um, should also see diaspora organizations not as uh, competitors, you know, not competitive, they're not competing, they, they are really there to complement. Uh, and, 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 and I hope that if, you know, I, I just wish that organizations working in the humanitarian sector in Africa could just pay a bit more attention to all the great things that our African diaspora can offer, uh, whether it is you know, the language that they speak, the culture they understand, they are already on the ground, they are involved. And uh, I think in terms of sustainable development, uh, not only contribute during disasters, but also look, uh, approach the African diaspora with an eye for engaging them, not only in you know that disaster that happened, that flash flood, that drought, but also engaging them sustainably um, and not only as individuals, as they are, as organizations are currently fond of, you know, there are all kinds of programs out there that are looking for uh, an African expatriate to come back and do this or that, but also look at the civil society, you know, the African uh, civil society organizations that are have been existing for such a long time, uh, are contributing meaningfully, uh, tap into that, tap into that. And um, finally, I think, there is, there is a whole lot that, um, you know, we can learn from other countries uh, who are more or less in a similar situation. You know, South-South collaboration, South-South linking and learning, um, a knowledge exchange. And I think finally that, you know, um, the important role that women play in all of this. Uh, we know from, for example, my, uh, you know, project that, um, uh, the leadership leadership roles that women play in humanitarianism actually, um, um, you know, leads to a change in gender norms and 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 and, and, and transformation in society because um, uh, women who uh, you know are, are on the African continent as as as, as business as business women uh, are contributing significantly financially to disasters as my project uh, shows. And um, they are by also enhancing their leadership roles and and uh, uh, you know um, and looking at how gender norms and social roles are being transformed in all of this. You know the the, the impact of migration for for women and how women um, you know um, are, are, are challenging these uh, patriarchal structures that already exist in, in for example in Somalia. Uh, that, that that is very important for women's empowerment agenda and 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 uh, you know social inclusion diversity. So speaking of sustainable development, the African diaspora can contribute significantly. Um, you know, and 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 I think it takes an important uh, decision making to sit down and 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 acknowledge them. And I think the African Union can start can start there, you know, by, you know, acknowledging the African diaspora in their policy frameworks, which currently, unfortunately, is not the case. Um, I have a whole lot more to say about what I think should be done, but I think it's important to also now listen to our audience and answer their questions. Thank, thank you, uh, Sarah, and thank you, um, Basher, for your for your um, answers to those questions. We are actually drawing to the end of um, <laughs> to the end of our time, so I'll just ask one final question um, for the both of you. We have discussed a lot of within this wider topic of 1.5 and second generation um, engagement in humanitarian action. There have been a lot of different sub themes, identity self-identification, you know, the importance of um, more research, the importance of um, more information coming from South-South um, examples. So for the both of you, out of everything that we've discussed, or maybe something that we haven't even had a chance to discuss, what would you like the audience to take away? Like one key takeaway that you think it is imperative that the people who have um, tuned in that are watching now are watching, you know, um, future and in the future since this will be recorded, what is the one thing you want them to take away from this conversation? Especially, would you like to start? Or Sarah, okay. I just would like to say, you know, that, uh, you know, African young women play very important roles in humanitarianism. And um, we need to, we need to, uh, you know, acknowledge that and 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 welcome that, and look into how we can tap into 
that potential for for the development of uh, you know our respective countries in Africa. I think I, I think that's my that's my argument. And um, no, thank you so much. This is really insightful. I would love for us to have a longer time to discuss this, but I would actually add like three points intersectionality. So it's not just about gender, there's so many layers about age, uh, migration history, because I, I saw questions also about that. You could be first generation, but might have been 20 years apart, but it's still first generation, but your experiences will be very different. Um, this trauma, when you talk about humanitarian crisis, or because of your reason was because of forced migration, intergenerational trauma, uh, trauma does um, cascade into that. And the evolution of diaspora. So we cannot just kind of say, oh, I've done you know nice research on diaspora and do that. This needs to be a continual process. And we know this, you know, in academia, uh, in practice, and all of this. It there needs to be evidence-based. So if you want to have the right policies in place, you need to do the, the research and the legwork and invest in that. Um, and that's not happening. So people um are still just kind of basing it on first generation of particular migration histories but not how things are evolving or evolved or the changes. And it affects countries of settlement and origin. It's not contained in one path and the transnational. And uh, I will uh, leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarhas. Thank you, Bashair, for your time and for sharing your wealth of information with us. This is even though I'm in I, I'm in this space, I've learned quite a bit, and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, the work, you know, Sarah, your work, seeing um, the work that you publish from your dissertation and continuing the work that we're doing with Shabaka, shedding more, more light, more information on this very important topic. Um, so I guess I, one final, final question. <laughs> How can people, Sarah and Bashir, since, you know, we've run out of time and I know people, we weren't able to go through all of the questions that we had, and I'm sure people might be thinking of questions you know, in the days to come. How can people get in touch with you? Just email, socials, like how can people want to reach out to you? How can they get in touch? Yeah, with you? sure. Um, I can put um, here our um, main email so they can contact us um, because it's not just myself, because you have, we have wonderful colleagues who've been also answering. Uh, you have Paul. Yeah, you've asked a very important question. Um, this requires sit down. <laughs> it's about how if no not going, you know, going home is not an option, how would you do it? Um, so yeah, please do that. Thank you. Okay. Sarah? Sarah, how can people get in touch with you as well? It's, it's in the chat, but I think it just sent, sent to the panelists. Yeah. Um, I have just posted a link to my blog. I have a blog where I blog about my project and other things, gender issues in Somalia. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, um, there was a question um, for me. Can I answer that, Mikhail? Uh, which one? There's a question in the in a, in a question in the Q and A about um, my project. Yes, yes, about your publisher. I was gonna tell you. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So um, I haven't yet published. <laughs> I am. Uh, I that's why I'm very very happy to be uh, participating in this webinar to have this level of exposure uh, to you know present my work and. Um, um uh, you know also um answer questions but um there are some two articles that i will be publishing um in a next year early next year as part of my um you know um, phd dissertation um on on women and um second generation but also leadership roles and the important role that women play in uh, diaspora humanitarianism during disasters in somalia and uh, so if you're interested, you know, follow me on my blog. And uh, I, I do blog about my work, but I haven't published uh, in terms of, you know, scientific, uh, scientifically. And I, but I, that will happen next year. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for Hopefully. sharing. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing the link to your blog. Um, oh, Bashir, do you have something, one more? 
Um, one last thing was um, a question about, and this is actually the truth is like, um, uh, I would say for first generation, people assume you you know everything about your culture and all of this because of your country of heritage is that culture is not transferred through DNA. It's transferred by practices. So um, it's just because I've been at the other end of it, which is being like, that's not what Sudanese do, or this is not it's like, how am I supposed to know? You know, <laughs> so, just want to put you know, on a lighter note. So um, you have to put in the, unfortunately, the legwork. Um, it's not the easiest. And I really commend, you know, commend people who take the risk of migrating because leaving home often is not a choice. Um, it's a necessity. And um, and we just need to kind of recognize that. And what does that mean, that disconnect? So, and a lot of people, that's why you almost have uh, homes become embassies <laughs> in a lot of spaces, so thank you. Thank you. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us this evening. It's been a wonderful discussion. I know we could probably go for like another two hours. <laughs> 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 but, um, we will have to uh, leave it here um, for now. So thank you to our panelists, uh, Sarah and Bashir. Thank you to um, our co-host, uh, co uh, the SOAS Center for Pan-African Studies, um, and our colleagues from uh, SOAS Center for Pan-African Studies at Shabaka who have been supporting us in the background. And thank you, all the attendees. Thank you for, for coming. Hope you've learned. Um, Hope you learned a lot. We hope you've taken some information uh, from this uh, from this event uh, that you can use in your own work or in your own lives as well. Because this is not solely uh, academic, or you know, it's not solely academic. It's also our lived experience. So hopefully, there's information that um, that you can take as as you as you go on in, in your work and in your life. Um, our PVs are our socials, and we've also posted them in the chat. So please follow us. On, on X slash Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, um, email us. Um, we are really looking forward to hearing and getting your feedback about this event um, or any questions that you weren't able to answer. Um, and we are and we're always sharing um, the research that we're doing um, on our socials as well. So we would really encourage you to follow both Shabaka as well as the SOAS Center for Pan-African Studies so you can uh, stay abreast of the work that we have um, coming up and the work that we're doing. So thank you, thank you everyone, and have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for organizing. It's been lovely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.